As a student, I saw medicine as a science. As a surgeon, I saw it as a skill. As a family doctor, I saw it as performance. And as a patient, I knew it was all of those. But what I experienced was the performance. Because as a patient, that's the first thing you see. Although, as a doctor, it's often the last thing you learn. Now, I've been ill quite a bit recently myself, and performance is what I've judged my doctors on. I took their, their knowledge and skill for granted, though it wasn't in evidence directly. I couldn't see how much they, they knew or what they could do, and what I experienced was their performance, how each one of them came across to me as a person. And much of this was about communication. That's how care is expressed, and that's where important things happen. But it's also where many of the problems between doctors can arise. Yet performance in medicine is under-recognised and under-acknowledged. And so that's what these lectures are about. So I'm Roger Niebane, I'm Professor of Surgical Education and Engagement Science at Imperial College London, where I lead the Centre for Engagement and Simulation Science. I've been a trauma surgeon, a general practitioner and an academic. And I'm fascinated with aspects of medicine that often escape attention. And one of these, I think, is performance. So I'll start with why we need to look at performance uh, at all. And for me, it's, it's how the relationship between a clinician and a patient is expressed. It's how care itself takes place. So as a medical student, the skills of working with people are often overshadowed, I think, by the need to learn science and clinical procedures, to memorise facts of anatomy, pathology, pharmacology, diagnosis and treatment. And the medical education system invites us to see ourselves as applied scientists rather than performers. For many clinicians, the very word performance can have a, a pejorative whiff. Somehow it seems to them inauthentic, not, not real. But I'm going to argue that this is a misreading of the concept of performance, because performance isn't faking it or putting on a, a mere show. On the contrary, expert performance is how medicine works. It's always there, though we don't always recognise it, we don't always re realise that we're doing it. So I'll begin with an area where performance is plain to see, the, the operating theatre. But first, um, a health warning. Uh, over the next few minutes, I'm going to show you some images of operative surgery. And I know not everybody feels comfortable watching that kind of thing. So if you're one of those, it uh, might be a good moment perhaps to avert your eyes just for a few minutes. Um, but anyway, so here's a surgical team. Uh, we've got a surgeon over there. Um, she's facing us on the left of the screen. On her right, as you look at it, is the scrub nurse. There's an assistant opposite her, an anaesthetist over there, a runner, quite a lot of people here. Um, and they're just about to start an operation. It's a patient who's been stabbed. So the team are opening him up, and they're, they're starting to make sense of what they find. And I used to do a lot of operations like this when I was training as a, as a trauma surgeon. First of all, you have to assess the situation, working out what's been injured and how to approach what's going on. And here we join the team just as they're beginning, uh, they're beginning that process. A fair bit of blood in here, actually. So let's pack the four quadrants. Okay, oh dear, quite a lot of blood swelling up here. Don't worry, that's the retractor, so we'll get that back inside so you can see what we're doing. We'll reattach really the suction, right? Underneath there. Right. Okay, can I have suction on, please? Okay, we're going to get that back in there. Okay, so we're going to get really tight. Okay. You will have gathered that the surgeons were trying to make sense of what was going on. And the first thing that they found was that there's a lot of blood in the abdominal cavity. That was it coming out through that tube. So clearly something has been injured. And we're going to fast forward a bit now to have a look at what they do when they have made sense of what's going on. Because with operations like this, you have to, you have to deal with the injuries you find. And often it involves clamping blood vessels, stopping bleeding, tying knots, that kind of thing. Okay, 
So in, in, although in this case, these operations you've seen have been simulations of surgery rather than actual surgery, the teams themselves have been very real. And this is exactly the kind of thing that happens. And, and from a clinical perspective, the team here are applying their scientific knowledge and their procedural skills to make an injured person better. And it requires anatomical knowledge and dexterity and expert team working. And we've seen instances of all of those. But Barbara Hepworth has a different view. Though she's mainly known now as a sculptor, Hepworth was a brilliant painter and she spent, she spent a number of months in the 1940s observing surgery after one of her triplets had been treated for osteomyelitis, a bone infection. This is from her series of hospital paintings. And to me, she captures something different from the, the pictures that I've just shown you because we can't see any details of anatomy or injury or disease. There aren't any instruments in view, no operating lamp, no anaesthetic machine, none of the things we saw in the previous video and that I think we often associate with surgery. We don't even see the patient. But what Hepworth shows instead is a group of people working together with a common purpose. She doesn't show what they're doing so much as how they're doing it. And to me, she captures their focus, their concentration, dedication, in a nutshell, care. And care is conveyed through performance. Yet these people in the picture themselves are probably not aware of how they appear to outside observers. Their focus is directed inwards to that patient in that moment. So whether you see anatomy, injury and surgical technique or a team working together under pressure or the expression of, a, of care for a sick and vulnerable person, depends on what you choose to notice. It's like this well-known image, which can either be a duck looking to the left or a rabbit looking to the right. And you can switch from duck to rabbit and back again. But at any given moment, you can only see one of them. You, you can't see a composite of both. And when you're seeing a duck, the rabbit becomes blurred. And I think something similar happens with surgery. When you're, when you're seeing science or skills, performance is apt to become blurred. So in these lectures, I'm going to try and bring performance into focus. So for centuries, surgery and anatomy have been seen as performance anyway. This is the anatomical theatre in Padua, which was inaugurated in 1595, almost exactly the time when Gresham College was, was founded. And the space here is designed as much for spectators as for those carrying out the dissection. You can see that the, the brightly lit table in, in, in the middle there is surrounded by several tiers where people would have been looking down. By the 18th century, public demonstrations of anatomy had become common, often including physiological experiments with live animals uh, or um, corpses, in this case, um, Hogarth's Reward of, of Cruelty from 1751 shows Tom Nero being anatomised by surgeons, again, in front of an audience, and we can see them all around the back looking on. In 18th century Edinburgh, one scholar wrote, the theatre of anatomy was the best show in town. And these anatomical dissections were framed as public spectacles of natural philosophy. They took place alongside experiments of the time with air pumps, condensing engines, electrical machines, the exciting new science and technology of the day. And by the 19th century, these public exhibitions of anatomy had developed into professional demonstrations of surgery for students and doctors. So if we look at the old operating theatre at St Thomas's Hospital, which I expect many of you have been to, this dates from 1822. Uh, and here again, there's as much emphasis on, on the people watching the surgery as those performing it. And so by that time, performance was becoming central to establishing surgery as a high status profession, especially in France. Though often there was, a, there was an interesting tension between instruction, clinical care and entertainment, spectacle. Sixty years later, Thomas Eakins uh, in 1889 painted the, the Agnew Clinic. And this shows Dr Agnew performing a partial mastectomy at the University of Pennsylvania, watched by an audience of medical students. And you can see there are tears of them there. So by the, uh, by the early 20th century, by 1910, the operating theatre at the Middlesex Hospital, which has now been demolished, uh, looked like this. Uh, and again, clearly with the expectation that surgery would be watched by an audience. And that process continues to this day. Although operating theatres don't usually have viewing galleries like these, many surgical procedures are streamed and anyone can watch operations 
over the internet. So although that raises interesting questions about who is performing and who is watching, the process continues to this day. So performance is especially evident in operative surgery. And even the language we use makes this clear. Surgeons perform operations in a theatre using instruments. And yet performance is just important in other kinds of medicine too. Something similar happens in the consultation, whether a, a GP consultation or a hospital specialist, and that too is performance. Performance with a very small audience. So in this talk, I'll reframe medical care, making performance the focal point and exploring how patients and clinicians interact. Now, this isn't to lessen the importance of, of science or technical skill, far from it. Those always remain central, but it's to highlight elements of clinical practice that are always there, but that we often overlook. And, and that's important because when problems arise or when errors happen, it's not usually because we don't know or can't do, it's usually because of performance. Now, one problem is that as medical students and doctors, we learn the performance aspects of medicine within the world of medicine, not within the wider world of performance. We learn from people who've gone through the same trajectory of learning as we have. And during our training, we, we enter a, a frame or funnel, I think, and we seldom look outside it. And that's understandable enough, especially in the early years of medical education, when you've, you've got enough on your plate learning what you need to know and what you need to do. But the problem is that there's a tendency to stay within that frame, even when you've become expert. And frames, like silos, are easier to enter than they are to leave. So it's natural to see yourself in terms of the domain of expertise you aspire to join and to exclude things that lie outside it. So if your domain is medicine, you think that only medicine-related things are relevant. You keep out everything that isn't in your subject area. It's a process of exclusion, of keeping things out, of eliminating what seems irrelevant and focusing on essentials. But I'll argue for turning this on its head, for recognising points of similarity with apparently unrelated domains, which actually have strong resonances with your own world. I'll argue for including experts who do the kind of thing you do, even though their purpose and methods may be very different. And that's a process of inclusion, of bringing in, of making connections. So I still vividly remember my starting my first major trauma operation as, a, as lead surgeon at Baraguanath, the huge hospital in Soweto on the outskirts of Johannesburg, where I spent several years during my surgical training. This is most certainly not a simulation. That's me uh, starting an operation in Soweto, which at the time was one of the most violent places in the world. And much of our work involved operating on patients who'd been stabbed or, or shot. And... Starting this operation, I felt a mixture of, of excitement and, and fear. The patient, like the one I showed you earlier, was unstable, losing blood fast. I was gowned and gloved. The patient's abdomen had been draped and cleaned, and the junior assistant opposite me um, over there, and in the background, you can just see a theatre sister holding out a scalpel. And, and I really didn't know what I was going to find, and I didn't know whether I was going to be able to cope. But once I'd started... I forgot that anxiety because it wasn't about me, it was about the patient. And I had to work out what his injuries were and do my best. So I narrowed my focus and I concentrated on each part of the procedure as I'd been taught. And luckily things turned out well. But afterwards I'd, I'd replay it in my head and I'd wonder if I could have done things better. Now, later I, I discovered that this happens to many performers, but when I was starting that operation, I didn't think of myself as a performer. I thought of myself as a surgeon, applying skill and scientific knowledge to make that individual person better. And it never occurred to me that I could learn from musicians or potters or hairstylists. But now, decades later, I wish I had. But crossing between frames can be difficult to do. So if we see an operation as a combined effort between specialists in different fields, as I showed earlier, surgeons, anaesthetists, nurses, working together, we might look at other groups, such as an orchestra. Today we have a piano soloist, we've got strings, background brass, woodwinds, percussion. All these musicians have gone through years of study and practice in the instruments they've chosen to play. All of them use that theory, that practice and that skill 
as they come together with a shared aim. And all of them face similar issues. For example, many professional musicians find performing stressful um, and performance anxiety is a big, it's a big problem for musicians. According to a survey of more than 2,000 of them, professional musicians, that is, the largest sample to date, 24% suffered, suffered from stage fright, 13% reported acute anxiety, 17% depression. And this is professional musicians long after they've completed their studies, once they're in their career in an orchestra or as soloists. And some situations, of course, like solo performance, are particularly stressful though auditions, I gather, come pretty close. Yet because in medicine we don't see ourselves as performers, we seldom think what we can learn from these other fields, even though doctors and nurses often experience severe anxiety and depression and performance problems too. So I jointly lead the Royal College of Music, Imperial College Centre for Performance Arts with my colleague Aaron Williamson, who's in the audience today. Um, this is the Royal College of Music at South Kensington, in central London, next door to Imperial College, where I work. And here's the view from Imperial, looking over the back of the Royal College of Music to the Royal Albert Hall, um, one of the most recognisable and iconic of concert venues. Aaron's a musician and a psychologist and a professor of performance science at the Royal College of Music. He describes his field as a multidisciplinary study which draws on psychology, physiology, sociology and economics to understand the mechanisms and outcomes of performance activity and experience. So our aim at the Centre for Performance Science is to explore performance across domains, seeing it not only in music but in science, medicine, engineering, education, business, sport and beyond. But many clinicians are not aware that there is a science of performance as opposed to a science of medicine. So, so what is performance? Well, I see it as something skilled that you do for somebody else. Performance may be synchronous at the same time, like a concert or a play where an audience witnesses it as it's happening at the moment, a performance like this one I'm giving now, when I'm giving it and you're listening and we're all here at the same time. But it may be asynchronous, like when a potter makes a vase that's only seen later, say, in a shop or an exhibition. But whatever the field, expert performance requires years of hard work. The more expert the performance, the less evidence that hard work becomes, and in the hands of a master it looks completely natural. Some of the most elegant surgeons I've ever worked with made operating look completely effortless. Anatomy just sort of revealed itself with a couple of tiny snips of the scissors displaying each structure just like the illustrations in the textbook. And although every move was calm and un unhurried, somehow it seemed that the operation was over almost before it had begun. Yet when I tried to do the same thing, I couldn't. I struggled to find the right planes. Organs refused to behave themselves. And I began to realise how much work had gone into that apparently effortless mastery. So if medicine is a performance, it's a performance of a particular kind, much of it's close up, taking place within each patient's personal space, rather than being watched by large audiences a long way away. And many professionals do do work of this kind, from doctors and dentists, of course, to opticians, beauticians, from tailors and hatters, to massage therapists, to two artists, long list. And I'm going to draw on two of them, a hairstylist and a bespoke tailor, as I examine how they gain their expertise. Along the way, I'll bring in experts in asynchronous performance, from botanical illustration and pottery. And then in later lectures, I'm going to explore other kinds of synchronous performance, how close-up magic can provide insights into the consultation, and how puppetry can shed light on teamwork. I've spent hours with all of these experts, watching what they do, finding out about their work, and they're people whose, whose work I... I respect and greatly admire, and many of them have worked with me on a master's in education, in surgical education, which I lead at Imperial, bringing together people from surgery with these outside experts. And I'm going to start with two of them. So Fabrice has over 30 years of experience as a hairstylist and a teacher. He's been a director of training at the Tony and Guy Academy, and he runs masterclasses for other specialists in his field, people uh, expert hairdressers learning how to do new techniques. 
He spent years distilling his knowledge and his skill as he trains apprentices. And he trains them in not only in the techniques of his craft, but in the techniques of working with other people. Joshua is a bespoke tailor from London Savile Row. He did two apprenticeships, first as a sewing tailor and then as a cutting tailor. And when I first met him, I asked him to show me what he does when he's, uh, when he's, when he's sewing. And here's an example of the kind of um, techniques he's using. He's, he's um, doing something apparently very simple. He's got a jacket uh, under construction on his knee, but you can see that there are many different layers and he's shaping and moulding them with no apparent effort uh, to create the collar of, um, of a jacket. And now he's much in demand making exquisitely crafted suits and jackets, which he designs for each customer. So in, these lecture, in this lecture, I'm going to trace a trajectory of expertise, mapping how performers become expert. I've based this on the, the sort of time-honoured progression from uh, apprentice to, to journeyman, to master, from, from moving from novice to expert to teacher, many ways of thinking about that progression. But the journey moves from struggling in someone else's workshop or their studio to becoming an independent expert, and then finally to leading, an exp to, to leading a workshop of your own, to, to teaching people yourself. So I've broken this, um, this journey into a number of stages, and I'm going to go through them each in turn. But just to give you your bearings, I started with, with the idea of doing time, um, then learning to see, getting to grips with materiality, a shift, I think it's very important, of moving from yourself to the people you're doing your craft for, not about you, the idea of developing your voice, your individuality as a performer, and then finally passing it on. And at each stage, I've woven my own medical experience as a student and a practitioner and a teacher with what I've learned from Fabrice, the hairstylist, from Joshua, the tailor, and from many others. But it starts with doing time. This is when you start as an apprentice. So... When I was a medical student, the course was quite traditional. I spent my first three years learning anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, and I, I never saw a real patient. And then came the clinical part of the course. Soon after I started that, I was told to go and do the bloods on a Saturday morning. That involved taking blood samples from all the patients for the following week's operating list, and there were a lot of them. So I arrived on the ward, a harassed junior doctor showed me what to do with the first patient and then he vanished, leaving me with a, an armful of syringes and needles and specimen tubes. And at first I, I really struggled. Um, but eventually I got the hang of it and it started to become routine. And it was, I had to do a, a, a lot of it. It was repetitive work. And at the time I often wondered why, why I had to do it, why somebody else couldn't do it. And as the years went on, I spent hours doing routine tasks, putting up drips, reciting catheters, usually in the middle of the night when I just got back to sleep. Uh, and often I felt resentful and put upon, boring, repetitive work of no apparent value. Fabrice, the hairstylist, he experienced something similar for him. It started with sweeping the floor and then making the tea for the clients as they waited, and gradually, gradually, he progressed to washing clients' hair before the stylist started work. He massaged their scalp as he applied the shampoo, and eventually he began to learn the basics of manipulating scissors and comb and clippers. But for years, he too was doing boring, repetitive work of no apparent value. For Joshua, the bespoke tailor, it was pocket flaps. These have to be made with great care, and they're much more difficult than you might think. They have to be subtly curved so that they match the shape of the jacket without gaping or looking wrong. And Joshua spent months and months cutting them out and sewing them. Every so often, he told me, his master would come over to him, have a look at his work and say, no, without explanation. So Joshua had to go back to work and do it again. But eventually he began to recognise when they weren't right and finally, he was allowed to move on. But ever since, pocket flaps have been his shorthand for boring, repetitive tasks of no apparent value. And we all chafed at having to do these repetitive tasks. But looking back, they may have been boring and they may have been repetitive, but they certainly weren't of no value. Quite the opposite. Partly because the techniques themselves are essential, 
Patients need to have blood taken, hair needs to be washed, jackets need pocket flaps. But also because this work was part of joining a group. By doing the jobs that nobody else wants to do, you become part of a community. But most importantly of all, I think, doing this work was how we learnt to work with people. By taking blood from all those patients, I was learning to go up to somebody I'd never met, establish a rapport, and carry out a procedure that caused discomfort or even pain. I learned how to relate to people. In other words, I was learning to become a doctor. Fabrice said something similar. All those cups of tea, all that shampooing, gave him the skills of putting people at their ease, of becoming comfortable with close physical contact with people he'd never met. He was learning to become a stylist. And for all of us, we became confident with entering people's personal space. Because at first, this can be daunting, both for you and the person you're working with. A doctor taking blood or carrying out a physical examination, a stylist manipulating your hair, a tailor working close to your body during a suit fitting, all those involve physical contact. And they need a combination of confidence and sensitivity and skill and respect. And you only get those things by doing it, and by doing it lots and lots of times. The next stage is about learning to see. So in order to, to perform with materials, you have to know, you have to learn how they behave. And that starts with looking. As a medical student, I was taught physical examination. I had to learn a sequence. First you look, then you touch, then you tap. Finally, you listen with your stethoscope. Inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation, the textbooks call it. Whatever the patient's symptoms, the mantra never varied. Woe betide you if you left out a step. Consultants would pillory you if you failed to do things in that order, if you rushed to get out your stethoscope and listen before using your eyes. And at the time, I couldn't understand what all the fuss was about. It seemed obvious and rather a waste of time, really. Surely, if a patient had abdominal pain, you needed to press their tummy to find out what was wrong, not spend ages to look at their face to see if their lips were blue. But in fact, it was essential, part of learning to notice that patient as a person, not to narrow down to one area of their body or to jump to conclusions. It was about learning to see. And almost always, those experienced consultants would, would notice far more than I did. When they asked me to present a patient on a ward round, they'd say things after I'd presented them. They'd say things like, uh, and what about the asymmetry of this patient's eyebrows? Or why do you think his breathing is rapid? Things I hadn't even registered. And later they would put these clues together to make a diagnostic story. And for these experienced clinicians, looking had become part of what they did. For visual artists, looking is second nature. For many of them, drawing is essential to what they do and who they are. Drawing focuses the attention, forcing you to notice what's in front of you and not just skate over it with a cursory glance. Bridget Edwards is a botanical illustrator. She creates portraits of plants using watercolours on vellum like this one. Her, her works for Kew and other institutions form part of the scientific record, so they have to be absolutely precise. But to capture the essence of each specimen, the exact shades of green, which are crucial to botanical identification, she had to learn how to look, not just to glance, but to really see. And she spends hours in front of each specimen, sinking her gaze into each tiny detail before reproducing it through her art. So first she sees, then she, then she takes that in, and then it comes out again as a painting. And Fabrice did something similar when he trained himself to register the nuances of hair, how it falls, how it catches the light, how it complements the shape of each person's face. Joshua had to learn that too, registering tiny details of each customer, his gait, his movements, the tiny little asymmetries that make each person unique. Because only then could he design a suit or a jacket that worked for that one person. The next stage I've called materiality, because expertise isn't only about looking. You have to recognise subtlety and difference in your materials and also in yourself. So going back to, to the bloods on a Saturday morning, at first I thought that all veins would be the same, that taking blood would be simple once I'd mastered the basics. I quickly learnt that every patient is different and that human tissue is infinitely varied and that what the textbooks tell you is not what you find in real life. And I learnt that my skills when I was relaxed and rested were different from when I was tired 
or overstretched or under pressure. Fabrice learnt about the different types of hair, about their textures and consistencies, how they behave when wet or dry, and he learnt how to make a rapid assessment. Before starting, to, to, before starting a cut, he runs his fingers through a client's hair to get a tactile understanding of its, of its individuality, its uniqueness. And Joshua too had to develop an internal library of, of how textiles feel and behave. He had to learn how they change with use and time so that he could make good choices for each suit that he designed. All those hours with pocket flaps, all that repetition and handling, all that time in the close company of his materials paid dividends. Now, a lot of this is impossible to put into words because it's about what you feel. So I'm going to show you in a minute a clip of a very experienced surgeon showing a trainee how to remove a gallbladder by open surgery. So the very experienced surgeon is over there on the left, um, scrub nurse here at our left, and this is the surgeon who is learning. Um, We're not going to see anything grisly here, but I would like you to to concentrate on, on on what the surgeon says. Can they call Mojo? Makindo. So that's the cystic. And once you get the gallbladder developed coming away from the liver bed. Oh, yeah, there you go. We'll make it a safer plane then. Uh, and there's this reassuring thing where you put a finger in. Try, just try that. Just ease a finger and then feel the. Uh, so he says, there's this reassuring thing, you, 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 you just put your finger in there and feel the... Um, and at that point his voice trails away. And that's because he reaches the point where what he wants to convey can't be put into words. What he wants to convey is a feeling. And in this case it's the feeling that, that all surgeons know when you are peeling the gallbladder off the base of the liver of what it feels like, of where exactly to put your finger and how hard to pull so that you can separate one organ from another. It's an essential part of this operation. It's something that all surgeons need to learn how to do. But it's not something that the textbooks can tell you because you don't see written down. And even if you did, it wouldn't help. At this point, you put your finger in there and feel the dot, dot, dot. Uh, Because it's something that is very hard to articulate. And I'm sure everyone in the room has had a similar experience, even if it's nothing to do with surgery. It's all about that knowledge that you have in your hands and your body. It's that knowledge that that words alone can't capture. And a crucial ability is to is to recognize not only how things are when they're uh, when they're in the normal state, if you like, but what are the limits of the materials that you're working with. Duncan Houston is a ceramicist who also teaches in art schools. Several years ago, he invited me to bring surgeons from the Masters in Surgical Education I, I mentioned, which I, I run at Imperial to Central St. Martins uh, in London, behind King's Cross, large art school. Um, and he demonstrated how to make a vase. And he showed what happened when he thinned its neck out too far so that it crumpled under its own weight. His phrase thin materials on the verge of collapse, captures something that all experts understand, I think, the, the, the ability to recognise limits, to know how far you can go, how, when you need to stop, when you need to pull back. And as a surgeon, I needed to judge how much tension I could put on a sick elderly patient's intestine after removing a tumour, say, which was very different from the amount of uh, tension you could put on the intestine of a, of a healthy 21-year-old who'd been stabbed, or how hard I could pull when when joining two ends of an artery together. And that, again, is what the textbooks don't tell you, these skills of performance that you only learn by doing. Yet Duncan and I couldn't communicate these experiences that we both had through words alone. We needed to be doing something while we were talking. And so I'm going to show you a brief clip of a conversation we had when we were both making a pot. Um, This is the first time I'd ever made a pot. Duncan, as you will see in a minute, is so expert that he is able to shape this pot uh, while apparently paying it no attention at all. Um, And and this experience allowed us to to sort of have a conversation about the things we were feeling. So, Roger, what interests you in what I'm doing? Well, as a a surgical educator, I'm I'm always looking for for ways of, of looking differently at how people learn and, and teach about surgery. And 
operative surgery is particularly interesting. The work that we've just been doing here in, in, in look, doing this pot mm. has made me think of all sorts of parallels with, with surgery where I'm here with my hands and, and some material which in a lot of ways feels quite like human tissue. It's slimy yeah. and it's, it's, it moves around um, and, and I've got that, that sense of how thick the wall of this pot is between my fingers and that's something that I think that you understand as a craftsman, yeah. that you can't get from books, you can't get from people telling you, you have to understand it for yourself. You so when we were talking about thin materials on the verge of collapse, we, we each of us had a different sense in, in, from our experience of what that meant, but it, 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 it meant something important to us, to us both. But medicine isn't only about things, of course it's about people, and you have to develop the skills of working with people at close quarters to make them feel comfortable. And you need sensitivity and awareness to read how other people experience your presence. And unless you do that, people won't be satisfied, even if your technical work is excellent. And performance involves multiple modes of communication. As medical students and as doctors, it's speech and writing that are dominant. Lectures, books, online resources, all the rest, all expressed through words. Yet in clinical performance, much communication is through other channels, through gesture or touch or side stance or gaze and as the excuse me GP and writer John Lorna said to me recently two silences can also be a conversation but in medicine we're apt to undervalue these forms of communication yet these wordless ways are the currency of care they're how we convey warmth compassion and concern or coldness disdain and irritation so it makes sense to learn how to use them and that involves reading bodies reading our patients bodies and our own so the next stage I've called Not About You. I learnt about this from Richard McDougall, who's a magician who specialises in close-up performance. He, he fell in love with magic when he was a child and for years he practised and practised in, um, in front of the mirror in his bedroom for hours, perfecting his techniques for making cards and coins vanish and reappear. And when he started doing tricks for other people, naturally he wanted to show off his skills. But after a while, he realised, he told me that that was the wrong focus. Magic is not about you, the performer, he told me. It's about them, the audience. It's the performance that really matters. And I think this applies to all experts. You have to gain knowledge and skills, and that takes a long time. Um, and so here's another magician, Will Houston. We'll be meeting him um, on a, another um, lecture. And he is showing the dexterity and precision that magicians require. And naturally, you want to show that off, but then, then you realise that it's actually, it's actually about somebody else. It's about your patient or your customer or your client or your audience, but it's not about you, and that's why you're doing it. You're, you're, you're there to find out about them or to do what they want to find out what their problem is. And it was the same for me when I qualified as a doctor. I was proud of how much I knew I wanted to show off, but, but soon I learned that most patients don't care how many exams you've passed or how many facts you've memorised. What they want is for you to make them better or to help them with their problem. Fabrice the stylist and Joshua the tailor tell similar stories. As a professional, you need to have all that knowledge and skill. Of course you do, but it shouldn't be on view. With every person you work with, with each audience, if you like, you only use what's relevant to that person in that moment. And with the experts I've described, this means becoming comfortable next to other people's bodies. Each of us has this peripersonal space, this sort of buffer zone, which we constantly reconfigure. Its boundaries are fluid and they change with context, with whether, whether you're with family or friends or strangers. It's, it's like a, a sort of invisible second skin. And as a professional, you have to learn how to enter and work within someone's personal space to inhabit it as you do your work, which requires skill and sensitivity. It's no good blundering in. You have to tune in to each person's response and adjust your approach accordingly, picking up the small signals that tell you how to gain their confidence and when to back off. And that takes a lot of practice. And I think that's what I was learning without realising it from doing the bloods, from reciting all those drips, from unblocking all those catheters in the middle of the night. That's what Fabrice was learning when he was shampooing clients' hair, and that's what Joshua learnt from all his suit fittings. So some performers are especially good at this. As I've mentioned, close-up magicians are extremely skilled at reading people's body language, entering their personal space without making them feel uncomfortable. 
That's how they can produce a coin from someone's ear without it seeming creepy. Some magicians, though not the ones I've been working with recently, take this to astonishing levels when they remove somebody's watch during a show without them even noticing. And something similar happens in a restaurant. So for some years now, I've been collaborating with the team from Heston Blumenthal's The Fat Duck in Bray, one of very few three Michelin-starred restaurants in the UK. And at first I thought of parallels between the kitchen and the operating theatre, and indeed they are there too, because there are skilled experts who are using sharp instruments to prepare dishes with delicacy and precision and speed. They have to do things um, that are reproducible and consistent, the same every time, and there are certainly parallels with, with operative surgery. But, but I think even more interesting is how the front of house team look after each diner at their tables, making them feel that the experience is all about them. Because restaurant staff know that excellent food from the kitchen is necessary, but not on its own sufficient. What people remember is how the restaurant made them feel, and that, to me, is an instance of care. Expert waiters move in and out of diner's personal space without obtruding, making each guest feel looked after and at ease. They approach diners from the side, not head on, avoiding confrontation, making themselves inconspicuous. Again, this is not about you, it's about them, it's the same thing. Learning how to pass through that invisible second skin takes practice and observation and a lot of, a lot of skill but it's key to close-up performance, whether it's in medicine or hairstyling or bespoke, tailoring or many other things. And for many people, it doesn't come naturally, but it is something that everyone can learn and get better at. But though that shift from you to them is profoundly important, it doesn't always happen. Recent cases, such as Ian Patterson, the rogue surgeon who carried out hundreds of unnecessary breast operations, or Simon, Simon Brammel, who signed his name on patients' livers, showed what, uh, what can happen when this goes wrong, when experts think it's more about them than about their patients, when the balance is distorted. So Not About You is about a shift from performer to audience. But who is the audience? And often that's straightforward enough, musicians on the stage playing or singing, audience in their seats listening quietly like now, a client in a salon chair, hairstylist moving around them, diners at a table, magician joining them briefly to do tricks. And at first sight, medicine seems similar, a doctor performing, a patient as audience. But often it's, it's not that simple. So in a GP's consultation, say from my experience, it often starts with the patient performing presenting their problem in words and gestures and silences, maybe, maybe giving a performance they've rehearsed in the waiting room before they come into your consulting room. The doctor watches and listens, an attentive audience. And then the roles reverse. Perhaps the doctor performs a physical examination, suggests a diagnosis perhaps, discusses options. Now the doctor's performing and the patient's the audience. Then things might switch again. And as I've continued to learn when I've been ill, especially recently, there's a lot of performance in being a patient, in getting the best out of a clinical consultation. Because being an effective audience isn't passive. It involves attention, concentration, engagement, sometimes preparation. Medical performance is a two-way street. My next stage I've called developing voice. This follows on from the shift from realising that it's about them and not you. And now we're on the cusp between being an apprentice and being a journeyman, between following a system and starting to branch out as an independent expert. At medical school, I was taught a formula for being with patients. It was about gathering and processing information. I learned how to take a history, how to memorise a set of questions to ask, always in a particular order. I learned how to carry out a physical examination to observe and to draw conclusions. I learned how to make diagnoses and choose treatments. I was learning to apply a system that had already been developed over many decades. I seemed interchangeable with any other student. And it took me a long time to realise that my personality was actually essential to my work as a clinician. We talk about bedside manner as if it was another technique that you could just pick up and put down. But it's really about you and your performance, about which aspects of yourself you choose to draw on and how you, how, you, how you respond in return. The American jazz musician, family doctor uh, as well, Paul Hayday, talks about improvisation, about the ability to drop what you've learnt formally 
and apply it in the moment. And a key part of this is developing your voice. As a musician, you spend years learning to play your instruments, practicing scales, learning repertoire, mastering theory, developing techniques. But then, as Heyday puts it, the jazz musicians who make a mark are those who channel the theory, technique and ideas of their predecessors through their own personalities, feelings and experiences. And that's what jazz musicians call developing voice, that unique style that means you can recognise John Coltrane or Charlie Parker or Stan Getz within a few seconds. And clinicians do that too. It's how they integrate their knowledge and their skill with the people they care for. When I became a GP, I realised that I wasn't a faceless cipher delivering what I'd learnt in medical school. Much of what I did, and especially how I did it, depended on my own personality, my style, my voice. In our group practice, patients would decide which one of us would be their doctor, based on personality rather than qualifications or experience, I think. And the reason some patients came to see me and others came to my partners was not so much about our knowledge or our skill as our personal style. And though the focus of each consultation remained the patient, how we performed was our own. Fabrice uses similar language when he talks about developing his individuality. As a stylist, clients come to him partly because they like what his work makes them look like after he's finished and they've left the, 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 the studio. But they also like the experience of being styled by him, the way he talks to them, engages with them, how he makes them feel as he's cutting and shaping their hair. And for Joshua's customers too, having a bespoke suit made is as much about the experience as about the finished garment. Each of these is an instance of an expert professional using their expertise in performance for another individual. Each of them is an instance of care. So this last stage I've called passing it on. This is how experts share their expertise with less experienced performers. It's the last stop on the journey from apprenticeship to mastery, and it often flowers late. Many people teach informally throughout their careers and everyone's learning from those around them all the time. But in the later stages of expertise, there are opportunities to do this more formally, to lead a team or to run a group, to help others develop the skills that you took years to master. It doesn't happen automatically. Like the other skills of performance, it takes thought and work and practice. Because being an expert performer is not the same as being an expert teacher. Passing it on requires another shift from you to them, a change in focus that puts each learner at the centre of the picture. So how can we make sense of performance? Well, since my time as a student, performance has become much more prominent within medical education. Communication skills programmes have become a central part of every medical school's curriculum. But although such training is helpful, there is a danger that students can focus on techniques for eliciting information, say, or breaking bad news, without making that crucial transition from thinking it's about you to knowing it's about them. It can be easier to ask a question than to listen attentively to the reply. So perhaps the solution lies in thinking more broadly about performance. In recent decades, performance science has blossomed and there's a huge literature in the field. Yet because clinicians are reluctant to see themselves as performers, they often miss opportunities to share their experiences with people outside medicine or science. Yet framing one's work as performance can be very helpful. Aaron Williamson talks of stages of performance, of preparation and delivery, then reflection, review and recovery. When I was doing surgery in the 1980s, I focused more on the preparation and delivery, about studying and operating, than on reflection and recovery. I hardly ever thought about recovery, I think, about learning when things went, when things went wrong without losing my confidence. And nobody spoke at that time about reflective practice. Yet that kind of reflection is what being a performer requires, because it's there that the most effective learning takes place. So in the next three lectures, I'm going to explore these issues in more detail. In December, I'll dissect the consultation, drawing on my experience as a family doctor and a GP trainer. I've invited Will Houston, the expert close-up magician whom you saw laying out a deck of cards there, to help me explore how his techniques can shine a light on what I thought I knew. We'll discuss the... Uh, idea of how magicians capture and shape their audience's attention during a brief encounter, often no longer than an appointment with your family doctor. 
In March, I'll look again at the operating theatre and interrogate some common misconceptions. I'll do this with Rachel War, a puppeteer and theatre director, and we'll explore the skills of teamwork and examine how people read one another's bodies as they work together in a dexterous team, whether removing a stomach or manipulating a bunraku puppet. In each case, the performance depends on sensitivity, communication and a subtle awareness of other people. And finally, I'll investigate touch, that under-recognised language of communication. I'll explore how imaging and technology have revolutionised our ability to make diagnoses and visualise the insides of people's bodies, and I'll ask how this affects time-honoured skills of physical examination and its impact on touch as a means of conveying care as well as gathering information. So my final images take me back to where I started. Medicine, I've proposed, is a complex amalgam of science and skill and performance. What we see depends on what we look for, and performance often hides in plain sight. Yet it's through performance that we experience medicine's beauty and its power and its humanity, and it's through performance that we see professionals working together in an unspoken choreography of bodies and hands. So I'm going to leave the last word with Barbara Hepworth with her vision of surgery as a performance that unites science and skill, yet goes beyond them both, of medicine as the performance of care. Thank you.